Sound. Alrighty. So we're live. Hi, everyone. This is um, on us TST. Um, it's a public and recorded meeting. Um, it's a first one actually after the election last week um, of the so welcome, um, Jordan, welcome back. Uh, we also have a brand new member, um, but he's not definitely brand new. He's a long time um, on us contributor, Jean Lee. Uh, he's not here today because he's probably on Korean time. Um, so anyway, congratulations. And we also have, uh, you know, obviously Brian and Carmelo who are kind of returning members um, continuing their, um, their sheets. So anyway, congrats everyone. Um, so today the focus is going to be primarily on micro ONOS as opposed to ONOS Classic. And Jordan's going to lead us through a discussion on uh, ONOS Operator. Uh, I'll hand it to you, Jordan. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so just, <laughs> so I sort of committed to this talk uh, yesterday. I've been wanting, so we've been working, or I've mostly been working on this operator for like a couple months, um, really. And I've been wanting to talk about it. Uh, and then last night I committed to it last to talk about it last night. So, so um, I just threw these together. So they're not not up to my usual standards, but I think I think um, they'll still be really beneficial to give people an idea of what 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 is changing and why. Uh, that's not the right button. There we go. Yeah. So so. What I'm going to talk about is just the, op the operator pattern, what, what an operator is for Kubernetes. Uh, and then I'll talk about and demonstrate uh, at the end the two operators, um, the two places where we're using this in MicroOnos, which is for the topology and for config subsystem. So the operator pattern. <clears throat> so basically, operators are sort of like uh, extensions to the Kubernetes behavior. I mean, it's a way to sort of customize how Kubernetes handles certain systems or services. <coughs> um, basically, you, they can handle provisioning, uh, scaling, custom ways to do to upgrade systems. Uh, a lot of them do like automated backup to the to the cloud <coughs> uh, and recovery, like. These are, there are tons of them for database. Actually, I'll show you a list of them in a second. Um, so they run inside Kubernetes as pods. Uh, so they're just a service that runs inside Kubernetes, but they extend uh, the Kubernetes API with custom objects. And I'll show, I'll show what some of them look like. Uh, and they interact with the Kubernetes API, um, basically listening for events, uh, and then reacting to events in the in the Kubernetes API, creating objects, uh, deleting objects, basically, <clears throat> basically um, uh, acting. They act a lot like uh, in Kubernetes, like when you create a deployment. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, um, you when you create a deployment, basically you're creating a configuration for a set of pods and an operator behave, can behave a lot like the controller, the other controllers in Kubernetes that will take, for instance, a deployment and uh, from it create pods and scale pods and things like that. Basically, the, uh, an operator is very similar to, to um, so what some of the core controllers do in Kubernetes. Uh, and so the operator pattern, like over the last, let me over the last like a couple of years has become really popular. Basically every big database uh, and lots of other systems have them. Uh, so it's, a, it's sort of a well-treaded path. <clears throat> See what I think. Yeah, so this is, this is sort of the first step to uh, creating an operator is defining, uh, defining a custom resource. <clears throat> And so there's this cus there's this um, specific type of, of object you can create in Kubernetes called the custom resource definition, and this is how you create um, your own objects. And so another project that also does this is Atomics, which we which we use in MicroOnos to store to store a lot of the state. And so Atomics, this is an example of Atomics's custom resource definition uh, to define a database. Uh, object and there's this section the real um, custom resource definition is actually a lot longer there's a schema and stuff down here 
But what this allows is for us to, in Helm charts or in other manifests, we can then create a database object which has a configuration that's really specific to uh, to Atomics and the way Atomics works. So this database object that you create in Kubernetes shows like it has a partitions field with which is a setting for Atomics to partition data across multiple um, clusters. It has a storage class which basically configures the protocol that's used for the database and things like that. And so <clears throat> then in the background, there will be an operator. So, so say you take that uh, object, the database object, and create it in a Helm chart or whatever, send it to the Kubernetes API. Um, an operator basically runs inside the Kubernetes cluster like this, listening to the API. Basically, I mean, it just, it really is just a, uh, a Kubernetes client uh, that runs inside this pod and listens for events and reacts to them by creating, usually creating other resources. <laughs> So for instance, the in the Atomics case, when the Atomics operator uh, receives a notification from the Kubernetes API that a database was created, it will take it and say, create um, a service for the clients to connect to it, a deployment for the, or a stateful set for the database, uh, vo persistent volumes for, for storing the state. And <clears throat> so the end, the end result is sort of that with this tiny, uh, this tiny object, uh, this tiny configuration, uh, you can, the operator can take care of what would otherwise amount to like maybe a couple hundred lines of configuration uh, to create all these different objects. It's basically like building a lot of the implementation details of, of Atomics into, into the Kubernetes API. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> Get it yelling. Yeah, so some of the use cases for operators that you see if you look in like the, the awesome operators uh, GitHub repo is, like I said, it's just can be used to streamline sort of deployment uh, and simplify home charts. <clears throat> there are some certificate management operators. Uh, they can handle custom scaling, uh, like custom auto scaling. Upgrades are a big thing, like a lot of systems, especially like say uh, a consensus database, uh, rolling upgrades may not be really be su sufficient. Um, or say the, uh, like you can build uh, backups into the upgrade process so that you have some automated backup upgrade and rollback uh, thing. Uh, you can build protocols like these into operators. Uh, yeah, and then like I was saying, uh, backup and disaster recovery. So those are some of the, so that, that's uh, basically the operator. Um, but so the use cases that we were interested in for um, Micronos was, uh, so provisioning the topology. So um, up until now, the way that we were sort of populating Onos Topo um, after the cluster came up was using a post install job hook. Uh, in in Helm charts, and it was sort of it was it was sort of problematic the way that it was being done. And so, what this kind of what an operator can allow is for us to just define the topology in in the Helm chart just by adding custom uh, objects for entities and things like that. Uh, and then there's uh, the operator could also um, dynamically manage the topology, which I'll talk about a little bit next. What I mean by that. <clears throat> And then managing the config model plugins, um, which I will also talk about in the config model or the Onus config section. And then uh, potentially in the future, this hasn't been implemented yet, but we also have other use cases uh, like other types of plugins that we potentially will want to manage in the future. So that brings me to the uh, micro Onus topology operator. So yeah, so the... So the, the Onus operator sort of has two sub operators. And so that's why there's the topology operator and the config operator. And each operator basically from Kubernetes perspective looks like a different operator. It runs in a separate pod and things like that. Yeah, so the topology operator, <coughs> like I said, basically is meant to, so that we can just 
uh, provision the topology entities, uh, relations, and kinds from Helm charts. And so it adds those types uh, in custom resources in Kubernetes. And so, yeah, so there's a kind uh, resource, an entity resource, and relation resource. And they look, they look uh, they're just um, exact mappings of the uh, protobuf objects. So the original API is defined in protobuf. Uh, they're just mappings of that into uh, the Kubernetes API. <coughs> And one of the things that, one of the reasons that I wanted to do the topology operator is because one of the things that we want to be able to do is not just represent uh, devices, um, devices below the control plane uh, inside the topology, but also represent services um, within the micro onos uh, system. So like we could add, um, uh, onos config nodes of the topology or something. But the problem with that is um, in Kubernetes, you have objects like deployments, uh, which can auto scale. So the number of nodes inside a service can change and they can scale up and down and the names of them can change, the names of pods can change and things like that. And so the like trying to put um, represent services and their nodes or pods uh, inside the topology uh, you have to have some something managing <laughs> something managing the topology based on what Kubernetes is doing to the service, <clears throat> and so that's what this does. And so part of what the operator does uh, is, since it's able to interact with the Kubernetes API, uh, it can uh, watch a set of pods and uh, ensure that they're reflected accurately as entities in the in the topology. And so one of the use cases for this is like we can use that information for mastership. Um, when there's a set of nodes uh, in, the control, in the control plane responsible for a set of devices uh, in the data plane, we can um, store that information in the topology and use that for to um, coordinate access from the control plane down to the data plane. <clears throat> and so these are, so the, uh, the topology operator, yeah, like I showed, uh, defines a few custom resources. So there's a a kind resource, yeah, entity and relation. And so now we can, if we have a, if we have a, a Helm chart and we want to deploy some specific topology, we can just put it in a Helm chart or in, in just a regular YAML file and just create it. And, um, oh, that graphic's not right. Yeah, and so the way that the topo operator works is it will listen for those objects and basically like when a when an entity is created by a helm chart it will go down to the operator and the the topology operator just hits the grpc api on on the on the um, associated onos topo cluster and so it will when an entity is created it will create the entity in the onos topo store um, when the entity is deleted it will delete it from the from Onostapo. And so it's pretty simple. It's just propagating propagating information from the Kubernetes API into the Onostapo API. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. Yeah, so the Onos config operator is much more complicated. Uh, and it was actually the original reason that I started looking at doing this. <clears throat> so in, uh, in Onos config, we have a concept of uh, config models, which are Yang models used, <clears throat> um, which can be uh, sort of added into Onos config and used to do validation and things like that. Uh, and in order to load the Yang models into Onos config, we use Go plugins. And so it turns out that Go plugins are, they're crazy finicky. Um, they're like, they're, um, you have to be very careful about how they're compiled to ensure that Onos config can load them. So like some, some of the rules are um, uh, a, the plugins, like the model plugins have to be compiled with precisely the same compiler as the one used to configure uh, or to compile Onos config. Uh, they have to 
the plugin module has to have exactly the same dependency versions or the plugin system will just say this was compiled with a different version, which makes sense. <clears throat> uh, and but there are some other weird things like even the Go environment variables have to be the exact same as the ones that were used to compile to compile the Onos config uh, binary. And so this can become a huge pain. And like <clears throat> if we're sort of expecting other teams to be extending the system and building plugins and things like that for um, for their own devices, it was sort of not working. I mean, not not very user friendly. It could be sort of a pain. I, at one point, I spent like days just trying to get one thing compiled. Um, basically, every time the Onos config dependency changes, basically anytime any Onos config dependency changes, all of the plugins have to be recompiled. <clears throat> and so the idea of the config operator is to automate that process so that users don't ever even have to deal with Go. Um, they don't nec yeah, they don't necessarily have to have, know anything about Go. They don't um, need to ever compile a plugin or anything like that. And when the system is upgraded, the, the, the config models will just work. And so um, the config operator adds two uh, custom resources uh, to Kubernetes. So there's a model registry. So the model registry is basically uh, defined somewhere to store plugins. Uh, and you can just, it allows you to provide like an arbitrary uh, volume to store plugins on. <clears throat> And this is the this is the actual template that we use in uh, in the Onos config chart currently to to um, basically store plugins now. And then it has a model resource. And so this is an example of a model. Uh, this is actually from the Stratum Helm chart. So so we have a bunch of Helm charts defining these <coughs> models. So basically, we're moving. Um, all of the Yang models, all of the model, the model plugins over into Helm charts now. And actually it's been done. And so this is what, what the Stratum one looks like. So um, basically the components of it are, it defines a, the plugin name, the plugin version, uh, and then a list of modules to compile. And I'll talk about what actually happens to compile the, the plugins. Yeah, so it adds two, two resources, the model and the model registry. <clears throat> and then what happens is, what the operator does is when an Onos config pod is deployed, it basically adds two containers to the pod. So it adds an init, init container. Uh, the init container um, is sort of, uh, it determines what version of Onos config is running and because that's extremely important to the, the compiler. Um, <clears throat> and then it injects a sidecar and the sidecar uh, container is the registry. And so we used to have, uh, the way that it used to work is we used to have a bunch of init containers basically load uh, model plugins in at startup and then uh, Onos config can read them from, from the file system. Uh, in this case, just to separate uh, Onos config from the management of plugins, there's a set, there's a sidecar container, and so the sidecar container uh, basically manages the list of plugins and has the compiler compiler in it, and so it's capable of compiling plugins that are added to the system. <clears throat> uh, and then it mounts a volume, the volume defined by the model registry to to the Onos config pod. <clears throat> and so when a when a model is added to the Kubernetes cluster, basically all the operator does is pushes the model info to each of the Onos config pods and it'll push it to the, to the registry, uh, to the registry container. And then when the registry container gets the model info, uh, it will store, store the info in a JSON file um, so that so that the Onos config pod so it well it stores the model info in on a in a JSON file on a volume that's shared with the Onos config pod so that the Onos config pod can get that model info uh, and then it compiles the plugin. <clears throat> and so this is what the pod looks like. It used Onos config used to uh, be the Onos config container and a bunch of init containers for for different plugins. 
Now, like I said, it's the registry sidecar and one in a container and then a shared volume. And so the model plugin compiler is the most important part, which is how do we ensure that plugins can be loaded by owners config? And so, I mean, the goal of this is that <clears throat> assuming, assuming the, assuming owners config, owners config is correctly configured, um, users, I mean, plugins should just work. Plugins should just be compiled and just the loading of plugins should just work and nobody should ever have to fight with those versioning issues that I had to fight with ever again. And so the way that the way that that's accomplished is, so there are two things. First, we need to ensure that the, the, the build environment matches, like I said, from, from the list of requirements for Go plugins. Um, and the way that's done is there's an annotation on the pods uh, indicating the, so we provide like a base build image for both Onos config and for used by the registry to compile plugins. And so the operator gets that from an annotation on the pod. I'll, I'll show, show where these are in uh, a demo, but <clears throat> so basically it'll, it'll get the, the version of the compiler, um, and use that to inject the registry, which is the compiler also. And then to ensure the plugin is compiled uh, with the same dependencies, um, the Onos config version is extracted from the annotations and that's used <coughs> um, to basically get the exact dependencies that are running inside of Onos config. And so we basically use the Go module system to get the Onos config module info um, using, yeah, using the Go module system. Uh, and then we fork the go.mod, go .mod, create a new Go module uh, to ensure that it has exactly the same dependencies. And the new Go module is for the plugin. Uh, and then we use uh, ygot to generate the Go bindings from the Yang model, uh, use some other Go templates to generate the rest of the plugin code that we want, uh, and then compile the plugin. And so the two things are uh, just using the same using the same base Docker image to build the plugins, uh, and downloading the go.mod file for the for the Onus config version that's running uh, are the two things. And using those dependencies are the two things that ensure that plugins compiled by the registry server can always be loaded by Onus config. <clears throat> Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so I want to show you. Um, let's see what else I have. Yeah. So yeah, I'll show a demo of, of these things actually. Yeah, this thing's in my way. Just just a quick question: is is it possible for this to ever fail, or is it sort of guaranteed success? I, I guess I'm wondering if we have to debug or develop the generated code that came out of the Yang model because there was some kind of problem or is it is it just always going to succeed? As long, so so as far as I can tell, as long as, so I did give one caveat, which was that as long as Onos config is properly configured and what by that, what I mean is that it's properly annotated. Um, as long as, as long as the operator is about, is able to determine accurately the, uh, the build image that was used to build Onos config and the, the module version that's running in, in Onos config, um, it should be totally reliable. Um, uh, but it can be sort of a pain and sort of confusing. I'm trying to, I think it's something that we'll have to smooth out. I think pro people will probably run into issues. Um, uh, like if you're developing, I think it's, it's very easy, like if you're working on Onos config itself and you change a dependency, um, in order to test that, you have to also change the annotations in the Helm chart and that can be sort of confusing. Um, and so I think- Okay, yeah, it'd be good to have, you know, documentation on that because I do, I do yeah. occasionally tinker around with some things inside of Onos config itself. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think it's something that we'll have to figure out how to a, a good way to make it clear that that needs to be done and how to how to do that. Yeah. So there are and, new. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was I was just going to ask another quick question, um, which which was just 
can on a long running system can plugins be added dynamically does does it have to redeploy onos config with new plugins or do they just get dynamically loaded in and ingested yeah, yeah that's a that's a very good question uh so what's important to me always with kubernetes things is always to assume that kubernetes will do things in crazy orders um and always assume that everything can happen in the wrong order and so i did i intentionally avoided doing avoided having to restart onus config because you know if even if somebody takes like um say you install two helm charts uh uh you install the onus config helm chart and then uh, your some config models uh you could end up or a bunch of config models you could end up with onus config starting restarting a bunch of times to to compile the plugins and things like that and it, people might start thinking uh what the heck is wrong with onus config why does it keep restarting and things like that and so no um it's uh it's specifically designed so that they can be added at runtime so it will try to basically compile and load plugins uh at startup uh any of them that already exist um but anything that's added at runtime they'll just I mean, so there's actually a gRPC server. So what the model registry is, uh, it has a gRPC server um, that the operator can push uh, new models to. And when oh. the registry gets a new model, it will compile it on the fly. Okay, that's great. And it, I assume it's smart enough that when you replace um, a model with a newer version, it, it would do the right thing? Yeah, so I've tested versioning. I've tested the module, module versions and everything and it works. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and so there, just FYI, there are um, two uh, new repositories um, for these things. The Onos operator repository has the <clears throat> both the config and um, topo operators. There are some examples in here. Uh, I need to update the config one, but there are some sort of complete uh, YAML files, um, uh, examples of the model. And then there's like a bunch of topology examples. <clears throat> Basically, this this is an example of um, storing like connection info between the control plane and devices in the topology. Uh, and then the actual compiler uh, is in the Onos config model um, repository, and this is what provides uh, the two images, uh, the registry, and the init container that's used to uh, initialize the compiler. <clears throat> And so I actually, so I, oh, let me make this bigger, hold on. Yeah, so I started a, started a cluster already. And just to show, this is the, this is the command that I used to, to install it. So we have the, we have the new uh, operator running um, and being used in the uh, Onos umbrella chart. Um, and there are a few values that, that I added to it to basically manage those annotations. And so there's the, there's like a Onos config uh, plugin uh, uh, set of values and you can configure the compiler version. So the compiler version is basically uh, maps to the build version that's used <coughs> um, to compile Onos config. And this is how the operator ensures that they're built, being built with the same environment. And then there's a compiler target. And so this is basically the, the module for which the plugins need to be compiled. And so you can see this is saying basically what's running, what the image that's uh, running inside the Onus config pods is uh, Onus config v 0.7.15. And so uh, the compiler will actually go to uh, go and fetch the, the, mod, the information for this module and use the dependencies to compile plugins. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so the Onos config pod, you'll see that the, I mean, so all that's defined in the Onos config Helm chart itself is just this this uh, this container the Onus config container itself, and the operator um, when it's when Onus config is deployed and it sees this annotation registry, this registry annotation basically saying uh, add the Onus config registry 
to this to this pod, uh, the operator will add the init container and the, the registry. And then these are the two annotations that it uses for the compiler. So there's the target uh, and the, the build version. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, not much. So, um, so you'll see that like in the init container, um, basically what it did was it got that annotation. The the what time is it? Yeah, I got time. Um, it got the annotation, basically saying the what what version of Onus config was running and. Um, downloaded the module and posted. And so it put it on like a shared volume that was access accessible by um, the Onus config container in the registry container. <clears throat> uh, and this also like primes the Go cache so that it optimizes uh, um, the compiler so that it doesn't have to download things every time that it needs to compile a plugin. And then the other container, oh yeah. And then you'll see that that's not it. Models. So when you add custom resources to Kubernetes, you can actually see them. Uh, the kube control command can actually query them. And so I added the, like if you look at, let's see, get CRDs. If you do uh, get CRDs, you'll see all the Atomics custom resources. And then you'll see the Onos entity resource kinds, uh, model registry models, things like that. So these are all the custom resources. And then you can actually query these um, just using their name. Uh, and like I can do, look at the stratum model. It's huge because there's a, there's a, all the Yang modules in here, uh, all the model, all the modules that are given to the, to uh, YGOT and a lot of other info. Uh, and so what you'll see is that the operator, like, so operators normally run in the kube system namespace. This is actually sort of an important point. <clears throat> um, basically, uh, a lot of the control, a lot of the other uh, components of the Kubernetes control plane run in this kube system namespace. And so that's where the operators typically go also. And so the, the Onos operator Helm chart um, or uh, manifest should be run here. Uh, and you'll see like the autonomous controllers are there also. But so this part of what was created in this cluster were the stratum and another uh, config model. Uh, and if you look at the config operator logs, you'll see that like, uh, Basically, like when, yeah, so this is when like uh, owners config was, oh, actually this is old cluster has a bunch of old stuff in here. But basically when uh, when owners config is coming up, you'll see it recognizes, recognizing owners config, uh, trying to send new models to it and everything like that. <clears throat> and then if you look at one more thing, Yeah, so when uh, Onos, when the Onos config pod started, um, it got a message from the operator uh, adding the device sim uh, one model to, to the registry uh, and then compiled it uh, to this path. Uh, and this path uh, is then uh, visible inside um, the Onos config container. And same with Stratum, the operator sent the Stratum model to to the registry uh, container and it compiled that. And then it becomes uh, loadable by, by Onus config. <clears throat> and so both of these uh, operators are just to, I mean, especially the config operator is just designed to make extensibility simpler. And I think if it works well, then we'll be able to use it uh, in other places, uh, hopefully, because we have other plugins that we're working on um, and Go, <laughs> Go plugins are uh, terrible to work with. So I think that's all I got. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah Jordan. Um, so 
two two questions. First, um, with the volume that's used to store the plugins after they're compiled, what's the um, do you have requirements for that? If that volume went away, would everything blow up? No. Do we need to? Yes. Yeah, so so um, by default, uh, an empty an empty dir volume is is used. So uh, it can yeah. So this is the volume um, that right, we right. Meant, well, um, this is what's being mounted. And so if it goes away, um, uh, plugins will just have to be compiled. Um, uh, Anytime there's an empty, anytime it's not found on disk, basically plugins are compiled. And then okay. there's another, well, there's another problem also that um, the model registry tackles, which is that I wanted to try to avoid compiling plugins when possible. So you can give it like a persistent volume, which I have enabled in the Onus config helm chart. <clears throat> um, there's like a way to configure the this model registry resource with a persistent volume. And in that case, the problem is that, like I said, Plugins have to be compiled specifically for the version of Onus config that's running, and so the way that the model registry the model registry handles that um, or the compiler is one of the things that it also gets from the Go module system is the the hash that Go computes for for each version of each module, and it uses that to version the plugins. So what's actually on the on the registry on this volume that's defined by the model registry is a bunch of hashes, which are the ha the module hashes for each version that it's compiled um, plugins for, and a version of each plugin within each of those. So, so the caches version. Uh, and I'm hoping that this will uh, allow us to reduce uh, the time that it has to spend compiling plugins on the fly while, while uh, not creating any more issues in version conflicts. Yeah. OK, that, that makes sense. Um... It might also might be useful to clear the cache yeah. of old versions. That's, that's, yeah, that's something I haven't uh, worried about yet. But yeah, yeah. The, yeah. I'm assuming these are pretty small as is. So, um, the the other question: um, Does this? It it sounds like is it downloading things on the fly, or um, I'm wondering if this would work air gapped. No. Uh, well, I mean, it's just the Go module system. Um, so it depends. Uh, well, actually, yes. I don't think it will work here, Gap, because it's um, it's basically all we're doing is running. Um, it does need access to Go commands to check the dependencies or to get the module info uh, to create plugin modules. Uh, and that's theoret that's theoretically only done in the init container. That's what the init container does. Is it basically runs like uh, go mod, uh, go mod download or whatever, uh, to cache the Onos config module info, and then gets that module, that info from the cache and uses it, uh, later to build plugins. But I, I'm, I'm actually not sure what the, the, the go commands will do if, if you're not, if it doesn't, doesn't have internet access. I don't know. That's a good question, but, um, sort of, I, I did go to sort of lengths, some lengths to um, try to avoid downloading as much information as possible um, just by building it into the build image. Um, so I, I'm not really sure if that's a way around it or not. So one of the things we did back in Volta is we, you know, we used a uh, module vendoring and then we checked in the vendor directory in, into our repos. I wonder if that would, help at all at least with dependencies ensuring that all of the dependencies were at least you know checked into one place yeah um, that could be an alternative yeah i think it it could be done uh, both ways actually maybe um i think that probably solves the air gapping problem also um so i think if necessary we could pretty probably pretty easily add uh, support for that as well So also, um, j just in terms of like data flow, um, so the Yang models are being included in the CRDs, so they're being they'd be backed up by the Kubernetes yeah. API data store. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. so if um, if the pod goes away, all it is is a compile cycle. You don't actually lose access to 
um, the CRDs. Right, yeah. Right, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so uh, in, uh, in Arno Psalm charts, we added a config models uh, directory, which has a bunch of all the Helm charts, FYI, which each one is like sort of laid out like um, there's uh, in the files directory is all the Yang modules. Uh, and then they're sort of added into the, uh, the model resource via templating. Uh, and yeah, so, so uh, yeah, those are just stored in Kubernetes. And uh, basically the operator, anytime, anytime uh, uh, an owner config pod shows up, it just starts adding uh, models to it. And so this actually turns out to be really good for, I think this will facilitate um, upgrading um, well um, because uh, since compiles need or since plugins need to be compiled specifically for different versions of Onos config in some cases, uh, this actually enables rolling upgrades uh, because you could do you could use the um, Kubernetes um, rolling update strategy to uh, modify uh, the Onos config deployment and uh, in the modification, also modify the annotations to indicate that the Onos config version changed or the build environment changed or whatever. And the Onos operator will treat each uh, Onos config pod independently. And so it will start compiling um, multiple versions of multiple versions of the Go plugins uh, based on whichever version uh, of Onos config is running inside a cluster that's rolling, that's doing a rolling update. And so I think it actually enables some, some new some new things like that too, which is cool. So now that this has been completed once, it, it would be, this is sort of a question for Sean, I think, but now that this has been completed once, we could pretty much do the entire same thing with either Rock API and dynamically build its API off of the Yang files um, using all the same yeah. techniques. Yeah, I mean, it's really it's really only a change in the umbrella chart is all that's needed, uh, Scott. I've been uh, playing with it um, and I, I, I'm almost ready to submit it, but I just wanted to do a lot of things to settle down. Jordan has done a number of improvements with the caching and uh, sorting out of bugs in the past couple of days. So um, really, I was I was waiting for this presentation before uh, I'd make that change on the Eater Rock uh, umbrella. But yeah, it's not a big deal at all. It's very seamless. Yeah, I meant the um, not not the Eater Rock umbrella, but the uh, the API. You know where we're building the Open API three oh, YAML files right. and all of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Um, yeah, we're doing it statically at the moment, uh, you know, after, after Y got generated files. Uh, yeah, it should be possible to, um, to even have that being satisfied by an operator as well. Um, it's something I haven't uh, got a, a plan for or, um, you know, even an estimate of, but uh, I can see definitely how this pattern could be applied. Yeah, it it you know it'd be really nice. If we eventually got to the point where it was just one set of Helm charts, and you update the CRDs, and sort of the whole the whole backend gets regurgitated with, um, or not even regurgitated. It just gets the appropriate stuff gets loaded in. Uh, but we're gonna we would have to take either Rock API and make it um, make it support plugins, which I think right now it's all static, isn't it? uh yeah 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 i mean but i i think it's it's really possible i mean it's it's something that that i uh, i should uh, investigate a little bit yeah yeah i i think this is really cool i know um i'm one who struggled with the uh, dependencies getting out of sync and having to invest hours in rebuilding things so jordan i i think this is this is going to be a great help um switching to this model yeah, i I actually was um, and, and I think yeah I just had a bad experience no, uh, sorry Jordan yeah so I had a bad experience with the plugins and that's sort of what a lot of what motivated me to to do this yeah. good all right this is great well as you mentioned this would also be um, useful for um, for the ASN one generated plugins too, right? So. 
Yeah, so um, the reason, so yeah, we're, I think we're basically just waiting for the, once they become fully automated, once we're able to generate um, generate the relevant code the way that this plugin does, um, or this this operator does, we can apply this pattern to other places. I think, uh, assuming, I mean, this is going to be a good test, test case, I think, for, uh, I think we have to see how much it will get in the way. Um, uh, we have to see if see if we can make sure that um, it's easy to still make changes to uh, the onus config dependencies. Um, but for me, it's been way easier. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this pattern can definitely be applied other places. It's been a lot easier to use the uh, cube control client for ingesting like arbitrary topologies as well. Um, yes. yeah. Thanks for your comments the other day. I've been playing around with it a little bit. Great uh, presentation. Thank you. Def definitely. Thanks again, Jordan, for putting this uh, together at the last minute. Are there any other questions? If not, I think we can um, close the meeting early. Um, I think we have another meeting coming up in about uh, seven minutes or so. So thanks again to Jordan and for to everybody for good questions. Uh, we will hopefully see you in two weeks. Uh, also, I wanted to remind everyone, if you have suggestions for topics, uh, please don't be shy to send them to me or to the TST in general. Um, that, and that way we don't necessarily have to skip, uh, skip meetings as we have been over the last winter. Uh, and again, both topics for Omos Classic as well as for Micro Onos um, are welcome. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks again, Jordan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.